Welcome back to The Mentors. This is Vadim. And Sergey. And you're listening to a show where we uncover the truth behind how companies get off the ground and what you need to do to avoid the critical mistakes that can get made in the early days of starting a venture. That's our sweet spot. We love working with very early stage entrepreneurs. That's the challenges that are the most interesting to us. And we bring you stories from our experiences, personal experiences in starting companies and investing and mentoring founders over the last several years. So today we're going to bring to you a continuation of a series called Fundraising 101. This episode is going to be called Fundraising 201, When to Walk Away. So essentially, master's level fundraising course for you today where we talk about what's next, right? Let's say you already got to a point where you're getting meetings with investors, you're pitching your startup, you might even already have a couple of checks that you collected and money in the bank. But what do you do when you reach a certain level of uncertainty? Maybe a conversation has progressed to a point where you're no longer comfortable with that investor. Maybe something new happened that you weren't aware of in the past, and now you're doubting yourself. Should I bring them on as an investor, or should I walk away? What is the smarter thing to do for the well-being of my business? It might seem like any money is good money, and if somebody is offering to invest in your company, what's the worst that can happen, right? They sign documents that says that once you have their money, it's yours, and you can do with it whatever you want. But that's just not the practical reality of how fundraising relationships and the relationship between a founder and an investor realistically plays out. Yes, when you take money from an investor, it's yours to spend. However, if you take money from the wrong investor, it can be a huge pain for you. It can actually sometimes even lead to causing you to shut down your business sometimes in extenuating circumstances. And we're going to talk about some of the main reasons why you might want to walk away from a deal, some of the red flags that you should look out there and tell you a few stories that we have come across through our time in coaching founders and working with them and some of the crazy things, uh, experiences that they've gone through when trying to fundraise. Now, this should make sense, right? Whenever somebody gives you money for something, they expect something in return. If you're an employee of a company, they're expecting that you're going to be a good employee and that the output of your work will be high quality. If you're a service provider, they're expecting that you will follow through and create a great service for the client. If someone's paying for food at a restaurant, they're expecting that the food is going to be great quality and it's not going to make them sick, right? There are all these expectations that come with an exchange of money. Same with an investor. A lot of investors, when they give you money, even though you are the CEO, they are expecting something in return. Obviously, a return on their investment is the basic thing that they're expecting. But oftentimes, once they give you the money, the relationship changes. Now you have their money and they need to get it back and then some. So the first story we're going to tell you is a cautionary tale about understanding when an investor wants too much control. There's a lot of nuances here when it comes to early stage fundraising, and hopefully the story will help you understand what's appropriate and what's not. So one of the founders that we're working closely with came to us a couple of months ago, and he wanted to get our advice on this particular investor that he was dealing with. And the story started off sounding almost too good to be true. The founder is doing well. He hadn't really been actively fundraising, but through a friend of his, he was introduced to an investor that was so excited about the business and the opportunity that he wanted to put in up to $1.5 million. He wanted to actually start off putting in $750,000 and then six months later put in the rest. Sounds great. He wouldn't even have to go to any other investors to raise this round. And he came to me saying, hey, this looks pretty good. Should we take this deal? And immediately, my sort of red flag alarm kind of went off. Typically, when early stage investors invest in a company that's this young, they want to have the assurances that there are other investors putting in money as well. They don't want to be the only ones in the round owning the whole round. It's a way for them to essentially get a little bit of a gut check that there's others that think it's a good opportunity as well. In this particular case, this guy already wanted to own the whole round without knowing the company all that well. Red flag number one. As we dug deeper into this story, it turned out that this gentleman was very wealthy and he was actually an executive of a public company. 
And he had invested in startups before, but they were all later stage startups or they were his own startups that his team put together. So effectively, he had no experience as an angel investor. As the meetings went along with this founder, and you know, I told him, meet with the guy, see what he's looking for, what kind of terms of the deal does he want, et cetera, what his expectations are for outcomes. The more they met, the more this founder came back to me, the more clear it became that this person did not treat this as a traditional angel investment, and he wanted way more control than was appropriate, almost like an owner of the company. So an example of the kind of control that he wanted is he wanted to have monthly meetings that the CEO would report on the key performance indicators of the business and make sure that they're tracking along the milestones. This is not an unacceptable request for a CEO to make for his team or even for a board to ask of the CEO, the board of directors to let's say meet quarterly to look over the metrics, but to meet monthly with one of your angel investors who essentially wants to set the direction of the business every single month and intervene every month, that will inhibit the company to grow quickly and to move quickly. Like they have to ask for permission anytime they have to make a decision. And to me, that was red flag number two. Why does this person want so much control? Red flag number three, he wanted to set the salaries of all the employees and have them be completely milestone based. Again, something that might happen later on when you raise millions of dollars and you have an investor that's sitting on your board, they're saying, okay, at most you can pay the CEO, let's say a hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the rest have to be allocated for salaries for other employees. And you know, the board essentially is your boss. But when you have one investor that's trying to exercise so much control when it's just the first money in at such an early stage, for me, that was red flag number three. And I told the founder to walk away because they're gonna spend more time servicing this one investor than running their own business. Now, on the surface, some of these asks aren't egregious. Sure, when you're pitching investors, they will want to know how you're spending the money. You will have to have line items in your income statements and in your financial projections that talk about how much the co-founders and employees will get paid. But if it seems like they are trying to control those numbers. If it seems like they need to be kept updated every single time an operational decision is made, that might be an investor that wants to be too operational in the company without actually doing the work. The thing is, investors are supposed to make it easier for you to build your startup. They're giving you capital to invest in your business to exponentially grow it. If it turns into more work for you, if it means that you're not going to be focused on building the business and instead will be focused on updating investors at a frequency that is not productive to the business, it might mean you should walk away. So to answer the question, what is standard for a relationship with your angel investors or your initial investors, let's say the first five to 10 people that put in money into your company, or maybe the first million dollars that you raise, again, we're using general numbers here in amounts, but we're talking about first money in, first year of your business, up to a million dollar raised, what is common as far as keeping your investors up to date? Most founders send monthly investor updates or sometimes quarterly investor updates. This is something that founders do as a courtesy to their investors, but not something that they're contractually obligated to do, but that is common practice. And then most founders in their investor agreement with the person that's putting in the money have something that says that the investor will get unaudited financial statements once a year. What that means is you're promising to give them financial statements every year, but they don't have to be audited by a professional, so you don't have to go through the hoops to get something prepared for them, spending a lot of money doing that. You can just do it yourself, and the expectations are you're going to do your best to give them as much information as possible. Later on, when you raise money for more professional investors, they might have certain information rights that give them access to certain proprietary information or maybe audited financial statements on a yearly or semi-annual or quarterly basis, but that's not necessary early on when you're trying to move quickly and when things change so frequently. At the early stages, at the seed stage, you shouldn't have to operate like a public company or even a company that raises series A, B, C, D round. You should have more freedom. Once you are done raising money as a founder, hopefully you are then focusing your efforts completely on running the business, whether that means hiring, building out the product, doing the sales, what have you, not managing investors. 
Later on, exactly, like Sergey said, if you have a board as a CEO, your job changes a little bit. You have employees under you that then take on certain responsibilities that you had in the past. This all makes sense in the later stages of building your business. But in the earlier stages, capital should make it easier for you to run a company, not harder. So if you're meeting with an investor and it seems like they want too much control, think twice about accepting their money because it might actually make your life much harder and it might increase the chances of your failure. Money is great, but if you burn through it and if you don't have enough time to actually build the business and to take it to the next level, maybe it was better not to take that money in the first place. The next story we're going to tell you is from some other entrepreneurs that were actually on the show that we'll rename Nameless that had another interesting situation happen to them when they were raising money because at this point they had a bunch of customers. They were looking like they were going to be successful. They went through a top tier accelerator program. They had investors coming to them at their door. Clearly there was a lot of interested investors and the deal was kind of competitive at this point. So Sergey is going to talk through that story and the caution behind exploding offers. So this deal was actually just heating up. The founders were generating some revenue through their business. They were getting customers. They were seeing growth in the customer front. And they were just starting setting up a bunch of meetings with investors, but did not yet have an investor committed in the round. So no one had yet said they want to write a check, but it looked like it was going to happen soon. And it was early enough in the process, in the first couple of weeks that they came to me, excited that they had a local investor who was relatively reputable who wanted to put in money in the business. He wanted to put in about $50,000 in the business. And they said, this guy wants to put in money. He's interested. We seem to like him. We only interacted with him about once or twice. But there's a caveat. He's saying that he can only invest the money at the specific valuation if we decide by the end of the week. Should we take the deal? Immediately, my red flag alarm went off. I personally hate any kind of exploding offer for anything, whether it's for a car or for an investment or for a house or whatever it might be. Sometimes they exist in the marketplace and that's fine. You get a sale offer and you have to make a decision right now. That's a tactic that's used in sales all the time. But when it comes to fundraising, An exploding offer is a tactic that uh, an investor might use to squeeze their way into the round at a better deal than anybody else. You see, this person saw that the founders were inexperienced and they were somewhat vulnerable that they needed money, yet no one had committed to giving them money yet. And they wanted to use that to their advantage to say, we're going to give you money first, but you have to decide now. And I told him, look, guys, your business speaks for itself. You're starting to do well. I understand that you're in a position where you need funding, but I would shop the deal around much more to see what kind of interest you can get and wait till you have other investors who are not going to put in these crazy exploding offers who really want to be a partner and want to be in the deal and are not just trying to make a quick buck. And luckily they listened and sure enough, within the next couple of weeks, they had interest from a bunch of other investors with no exploding offer with actually better valuation numbers because they didn't decide to jump the gun and take this first offer. So when you feel like an investor is using pressure tactics, that is not a good indicator of what the relationship is going to be like moving forward. I think with a lot of this stuff, even if you're not an experienced fundraiser, you could use your intuition. You could listen to your gut feeling. Obviously, these entrepreneurs came to Sergey because their gut was telling them, that something is off here. This doesn't feel right. Now, of course, there may have been some trepidation for not taking the money because they didn't know if they were going to have successful meetings in the next couple of weeks. There was some unknown, but their gut was telling them that this doesn't feel right. And when you're taking money from an investor, again, you're getting into a different type of relationship. It is not a decision that should be taken lightly by either side. And typically, investors that you acquire early on come on board because there's mutual trust that's created. If someone's giving you something like an exploding offer, to me, the trust melts away, it creates uncertainty, and that sets the stage for the rest of the relationship, which again, could mean life or death for a startup. So what's the right way to react to that kind of an exploding offer? I would say... We really appreciate your offer, but we're just starting to meet with investors. We want to make sure that we take the right partners onto the team and we can't accept the offer to invest this week, but we can get back to you next week and see what the reaction is. 
You know, they should be willing to wait. They should understand that you're doing a smart thing by meeting with other investors. And if they really want to get into the deal, they should try to offer as much upfront value as possible and let you come to the conclusion that you want them as an investor versus them trying to squeeze in. The last story we're going to tell you is a cautionary tale about taking money from inexperienced investors. Historically, it's also been known as dumb money. In the past, investors used to say that you can raise money early on from friends, family, and fools or rich people with money that don't understand your business or the market and the risks of making angel investments. That is also known as dumb money. So they are giving you capital. They're giving you money that you may need, but there's going to be no other value beyond that. No introductions to customers, no introductions to other investors, no help with recruiting, no help with product, nothing, just the capital. So Sergey, can you tell us a little bit about that story and what are some of the risks of taking money from inexperienced investors? And then maybe what are some cases where you do want to take money from somebody that can't help you in any other way? Yeah, I mean, I'll start off by answering the second question, which is, is it ever okay with taking quote unquote dumb money? There's a difference between dumb money that comes from experienced investors and dumb money that comes from inexperienced investors. If someone has never written an angel investment check or a startup check before and they're wealthy, that is much more risky than taking money from someone that's not going to add a ton of value to you, but they've written a bunch of checks and they understand the risks and the implications of investing in a very early stage startup. So the expectations are aligned, right? Better to take money from an investor that can add value, that can provide some experience or expertise. But if you need money and you have an experienced investor that wants to put in but just doesn't have that specific expertise, that can be okay if you trust them and if they're vetted. In this example, though, these founders were unfortunately in a situation where they were desperate enough for funding that they were willing to take money from absolutely anyone that wanted to give to them. And this was a medical device company that through an introduction through a former colleague of theirs, they were able to get a meeting with a wealthy doctor who was excited about startups and wanted to start investing in startups. Now, that's great. Everyone's going to make their first angel investment, right? An investor wants to put in money in your startup. But if this is your first go as a founder, I would recommend not to take money from someone that's never invested in a startup before. And if you do, if it happens to be a close friend, that you really trust, then maybe it's okay if you do the expectation settings. But to a stranger that you don't trust, definitely don't do it. And this is what happened. They took the money. It was about $250,000 from this gentleman. It was the only money they took. Another sort of bad decision. Usually you want to take money from more than one investor so that at least you can use one investor to manage expectations for the other one. But here they took money from one. And by the way, so that when you do run out of money, you have multiple people to go to to double down and help you raise a subsequent round. Yeah. And they, at this point, had tried raising money for about six months. It hadn't really worked out. They didn't really get enough. And so when this guy came wanting to write the check, they didn't really think of the red flags and they just took that money. Well, what happened was that over the next six months, they spent the bulk of it on going through certain regulatory approval processes and product development, something that they told the investor was going to happen, but ended up costing a little bit more than they thought it would. They thought once they went through these approvals, they'd be able to raise more money, but it just so happened that they were not able to successfully get follow-on funding, and they were running out of money quickly. And just as this was happening, a company that they met through their network came to them saying they wanted to acquire them. It was going to be like an aqua hire kind of situation, but the company would take them onto their team. They would buy, spend a little bit of money on the intellectual property that they had developed, and they would have it in-house. And the founders and any previous investors in their company would get to have some upside and still be able to make a return on the investment. But as part of this new entity now that owned this intellectual property, basically the stock would transfer to this new entity stock. A decent deal, not the mega, you know, great startup outcome that these founders wanted, but it's something that saved their company. It saved them. It gave them an opportunity to continue doing good work, working toward this product. But it, as now part of this new entity, it gave some upside opportunity for the previous investor, and it didn't force them to fully shut down and liquidate and completely get rid of all the assets that they had created. But for this investor, this turned out to be an unacceptable option. 
even though it was the only option, he wanted them to press forward. He wanted them to go for the unicorn status. He wanted them to become a hundred million dollar, a billion dollar company and swing for the fences. The only problem is they had no more juice left. They had no more money left. Nobody wanted to give to them and that was just not an option. But because this investor was not experienced enough to understand that most startups fail and if a founder doesn't have the resources to keep going, sometimes you have to accept that as a loss or as a break even, he threatened to sue them and to sue the company for his money back, which was already spent. Because this lawsuit was hanging over them, the best outcome for them now was to liquidate the company, which they had to do. Unfortunately, we're in the situation where they had to bankrupt the company. And luckily, the acquiring company still gave them jobs, but it wasn't as good of an outcome for them. And certainly a zero outcome for that initial investor who essentially just screwed himself by threatening to sue this company. Obviously not the outcome that you want as a founder, but sometimes these things happen especially when you take money from an inexperienced investor who has completely different expectations than you. So setting expectations, especially if you're raising from people within your close network, like wealthy friends and family, is incredibly important. Yes, you want to excite them on an opportunity. Yes, you want to communicate to them how you have access to the market, how you will tackle it, why it is such an attractive investment for them. But you should also tell them the truth. They should also understand that an early stage investment likely goes to zero, that it's the equivalent of putting your eggs into one basket and then letting it float away into the ocean and hoping that it comes back to you. That was a really weird analogy, but it's (laughs) kind of close. There's a reason why they say that as a seed or angel investor, you need to make at least 20 to 30 deals, write 20 to 30 checks in order to start seeing some returns in the future. That is just a big enough sample set you have to get in order to hit on a couple of investments that actually provide a return. A big chunk of them will go directly to zero. A certain percentage of them will break even. Effectively, you'll get your money back. And then maybe one or two will give you a return. And hopefully one of those will be a unicorn that can then make up for all the other losses. That's exactly how venture economics work and certainly how seed investor and angel investor economics work as well. So when you're talking to that less experienced investor, if you're going to be taking money from them, ask them how many investments have they made or are they planning to make this year? Are they going to be comfortable if they end up losing all of that money? Most of these first-time investors only write ten to $25,000 checks for a reason. Like Vadim said, they're trying to make 30 investments and not burn through all of their savings in the process. So if somebody is a first-time angel investor and they're trying to give you a large check, make sure you're doing some extra expectation setting there. Notice that this is not something you have to do with experienced investors. Experienced investors understand and know that they can lose all the money and that's a highly likely outcome. And they have had plenty of situations where acquisitions like the one that I described that were not super favorable had happened in the past. So they know that that is a likely outcome. But for other types of investors, if you're going to take that kind of dumb money, you're going to have to do the educating yourself. If you have a friend right now that is going through the fundraising process and has never done it before, please share this episode with them and maybe it will provide them some context for what to look out for when dealing with investors. Ultimately, you're dealing with different personalities, people with various sets of experiences, whether it's in investing or in certain industries. And when you're dealing with humans, these questions may come up, certain uncertainty may surface to the front and if you're equipped with knowledge about different scenarios and things that other entrepreneurs have been through you're that much more likely to make a more informed and intelligent decision throughout the process so if you do have that friend please go into your podcast listening app click on share and send it to that one friend i'm sure they'll appreciate hearing about some of these cautionary tales Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you have other questions about fundraising that you would like for us to cover in a future episode, just email us at info at thementors.co and we'd be happy to cover that topic. Have an awesome week and we'll see you next week.